and we're live, except my camera's not on. Okay, hit it, fund it. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us out there in the audience? Please let me know. Hello, can you hear me? Can't get the fucking thing to stand up on its own. <laughs> can you hear us out there? Give us a yes. Come on, somebody. Hello, hello. Jesus Christ. They're not, okay, yes. All right. <laughs> hello. This is the RPG Pundit, the final right. boss in Internet Shiplords. And this is uh, Inappropriate Characters. I'm joined, as usual, by Venture Satanis and Florida Man RPG, who are uh, both here with me tonight. But we also have a very special guest star, Greg Gillespie. Now, if you're an OSR gamer... Um, there's a chance you might not know his name because he, he's he's pretty low key, but you'll probably know the uh, the adventure he wrote, which personally I consider to be one of the best designed dungeons, it, it, definitely in the OSR history, but probably of all time, which is Barrow Maze. And uh, recently yeah. he's back and he's working on a well, he's he's finished. Uh, it's available now, I, as far as I understand it. I, yeah, I know it's available now because it's actually. Uh, it's actually it, it took my spot at the at, in the OSR bestsellers list, uh, Duero Deep. <laughs> so it took it took over from Sword and Caravan. Sword and Caravan was a uh, was up by the front there, and then the the two editions, Duero Deep and Duero Deep Five E, have bumped it down to number four now, along with the Tome of Adventure design. So, <laughs> but no hard feelings. I'm sure it's a good uh, it's a good book, and it's obviously selling well. So, uh, Greg, welcome to Inappropriate Characters. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. And we've already got a subscriber, it looks like. Did you see that, Job? Uh, yeah, uh, but I didn't write his name down fast enough. I think it said Bill Griggs. I think so, yeah. yeah. So, welcome, Bill. Thanks for subscribing. Excellent. And welcome, All right. Greg, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. So, so Greg, we're... Um, Going to start out for our audience. We've, we've got okay. Well, we got a good number of people already here. So um, basically, uh, there, there's a bit of a story that happened to you recently, and and we want to talk about that. Um, but but I guess first the the best thing would be to have an introduction. So um, you you're an OSR writer. You've made Barrow Maze. Um, what what do you want to tell us about yourself in the context of the hobby? Um, not too much. I mean, uh, probably like most of you and, and, and your listeners tonight, I got a love of Dungeons and Dragons at an early age and fantasy adventure. And the game certainly given me a lot. It was like a, it was like a training ground for academia, which, uh, which is my uh, trade. So, uh, I just was given a lot by the game and I'd like to give back to the game. And I have a, uh, I don't know, I think there's a sweet spot for me where I, I like I'm like a vanilla fantasy adventure, medieval fantasy kind of guy. So I think uh, that's always the sweet spot for for the hobby. Of course, there's room for other games and, and other ways of, of doing. But but that's that's the space where I like to find myself in. And uh, so I've just been working on a I have a six part mega dungeon um, process that uh, and Dora Deep represents the fourth of, of six. So I've got uh, two more um, that I'm working on, and I'm sort of like now filling out the uh, outdoor survival map that they're was dead. that was used for the Look first hex crawling with uh, Gary Gygax back in the day. Excellent. And so, um, and Barrow so, Maze, um, as I said, at least I don't know. I don't know if Joe and Venger have had experience with it, but I I actually ran it. Um, and I thought it was amazing. My players thought it was amazing. I had some some players that um, are not, as a rule, enormous fans of you know long dungeon crawls. Like they're fine with doing like one adventure where they go into the dungeon, do something, and then leave, right? But my my adventures tend my campaigns tend to have a lot of other stuff that isn't just um, adventuring in dungeons. And there's quite a few of my players that that tend to prefer that. But all of them, including the ones that, as a rule, are are the ones that kind of groan at 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 having to go into a dungeon. Um, they were 
they were all of the impression and that entire campaign that and yeah that was a long campaign that we ran that was the the best dungeon that they had that they had gone into you know so it was uh it's quite impressive I and appreciate uh, that. Uh, sorry i appreciate that very much <laughs> yeah well it's just the truth and uh what i would like to know is is um first of all what led you to write barrow maze and um was did you was was it something that you did first <laughs> for your campaign or was it you know like consciously designed because we get some of these osr designers that are like yeah this is a dungeon that i've been you know working with my gaming group for 20 years right and sometimes that's true and sometimes like in james malazuski's case it's a load of bullshit but uh, but then there's other guys that are like no i just i just designed this and it's you know i ran it after i designed it and and i was going to publish, publish it right from the start right it's not a so so what's the case in duramis was this something that grew organically or was it like intelligent design uh well i'd like to think it was both um but so it in my home game, uh, we I sort of like created like a sandbox and West Marches style, and so and we had a group chat during the week. So my players, what I encouraged them to do was decide amongst themselves where the, where they wanted to go. Give give me a couple days to prepare, and then uh, we'd be away to the races. And I sort of like you know parachuted a couple small like module level dungeons in there. And so they, they come up with a decision about where they wanted to go. And then we play on Friday night or Saturday night, whatever. And they changed their mind once they got to the table. And that sort of burned my ass a few times. So I'm like, I'm going to create like a tent pole mega dungeon. And for the longest time, I just called it the Necropolis because I knew I wanted it to be an undead themed uh, mega dungeon. So, uh, and that's sort of like how it, how it started. And like, I had, I've had a lot of experience in academic publishing, but in academic publishing, you only have to worry about the, the content and the theory and the, and, the, and the sourcing. You don't have to worry about layout. You don't have to worry about anything along that line. Somebody else does that. So uh, what I did was is I sort of broke Barrow Maze into two parts. There was sort of Barrow Maze 1, which you put on your title screen. And then a couple of years later, I did this, the second half of it. So that's how it began. And I really didn't even know. Like, I just kind of thought it was a LARP thing. Probably nobody would be interested. Um, but uh, but they were. It did de develop organically from from play. Uh, that's uh, and uh, a lot of the some of the best gaming uh, I've had in my life uh, playing because a lot of the players, like a, a lot of them, were coming from a three E experience. They didn't really understand exactly what how lethal old school play was, and that if you like leveling up an old school play is a really big deal. Like every high five around the table, even if you make it to second level sort of thing. So I had to sort of teach them that, like, what do you do when, when you're, uh, you have to bring to the character rather than the character brings to you. So I had to like, and then we had to go through, you know, you can't always kick down the door and kill the monsters. You want to sneak your way in, pilfer the treasure, sneak your way back out. So I had to sort of like teach that style and, and we had just a great time. There's a great mix of, of older players with lots of experience and younger players that didn't have any. And so, yeah, and that's why I like, I've got those um, little call out boxes in Barrow Maze because there were literally things that, you know, even from a design standpoint, uh, you just, there's no way you could anticipate because, you know, if you get a really extraordinary group of players that are veteran, they know what they're doing. Um, you can't anticipate everything that will do. So you just try to make sure that you cover as many bases as you can. And then once Bear Maze 1 and 2 got under their feet, I was like, okay, well, you know, I need to, if I want this to be like a, a classic, like a, a dungeon that people keep coming back to, I need to do a new layout. I need to, I need to get a top-notch uh, cover artist like Errol Otis. I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, that everything was taken care of so that this could be a game that people will be playing a decade later, two decades later. And that's, that's the, the short version of the long story of, of Bear Maze. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's great. And, uh, then you, you've now recently come out with Duero Deep, which is, uh, I guess in a way it's, it's, a it's, a, a further, a further along in the series of Bear Maze. Am I correct with that? I haven't really had a chance to look at Duero Deep yet, so I couldn't authoritatively yeah, so say it, but it sounds like it, right? 
And sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, and what I was going to ask, just you can answer this together now, is uh, in in Duero D, what is different about it from Barrow Maze, and um, is it something that everybody who's liked Barrow Maze is is going to like? you're sure are going to like Duero Deep or is it, or is there something different about it compared to Barrow Maze that, uh, that is going to be, um, you know, that, that doesn't just exactly follow the same mold as Barrow Maze was? Yeah, uh, I think yes is the short answer. So even like I'm working on expanding the definition of a mega dungeon. So it, like it doesn't have to be just vertically tiered layers that correspond to character level. There's many different ways of going about it. So I'm just trying to creatively think around how mega dungeons can be delivered and what they can do. So the Bear Mace was the first, the Forbidden Caverns of Archaea was the second, Highfell the Drifting Dungeon was the third, and then Dwayo Deep is the, pardon me, the fourth of six. So uh, if Dwayo Deep is the first dungeon that, that needs more DM input into the creation of sub-levels, so like Bar Bar Maze was a reaction to what I really didn't like about Mega Dungeons to that point, um, most of which came from, of course, TSR and then third, third party stuff. So, so, so we've got some fireworks going off here. I don't know if you can hear that. But um, I didn't like that. You, there was so much work to go in to play a Mega Dungeon before you could actually sit down at the table and play it. And I wanted Barrow Maze to be done. Like all the, all the stuff a DM needed to do was there, ready to go, with the exception of a few random tables that could be easily rolled at the table. Yeah. And uh, Archaea was taking the notion of the Caves of Chaos and then blowing up the scale. So again, like I'm, I'm writing for primarily the veteran player, like people our age who grew up, they've played everything, they've read everything, uh, they have a pretty firm grasp of how to go at various situations, traps, monsters, and things. And I'm trying to, uh, trying to um, interest the veteran player, the veteran hobbyist. So if I'm doing that, um, they have a high standard. They know what's, what's going on. And if I can um, confuse them or I can present them with challenges, then I think I'm doing the right thing. Okay. Um was it here? Steve Roberts in the live chat was saying, uh, which OSR system is Duero Deep for? So uh, Duero Deep can be played with any TSR era uh, edition or their clones. Yeah. So you can play it like my, if you're like, what, what I designed for is really D&D point seven five. It's halfway between BX and AD&D. So I want to play with the BX engine. Uh, but I want the Chrome of AD&D. Uh, I do not want to play with, I don't want to count segments. I don't want to play with weapon speed factors. I don't want to play with uh, armor modifiers. Uh, like I just, that's just actuarial science. It's not very fun to me. And quite honestly, most people just cover it up and then you end up with clarifications at the table and that sort of thing. I want to play fast, uh, but I want the Chrome, the spells, the magic items, the monsters, et cetera, of AD&D. Uh, at my disposal. All of the bro SR are having epileptic seizures right now. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. I, I'm not, I don't begrudge anybody uh, playing, but when I sit down at the table, I want to play fast. And, yeah, agree. Um, you know, there's too many things that can get bogged down. You know, players are going to enter a room, they sit around talking about it for half an hour before they actually do it. When you add in that, and then you add in all the other stuff, like to me, um, like, that's the way we played organically when we were younger. And in speaking to people at conventions and online, they played that way too. Uh, a lot of people, I'd be sure I played by the book as well and in second edition and so on. But that's really the sweet spot for me, the engine of, of BX with the Chroma of AD&D. All right, so Joe Venger, Ella. <laughs> you guys have got any questions for Greg? Do you wanna go first, Joe? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I just wanted to call out, we did get a super chat uh, from Chris Miller, I guess, of Mad Scribe Games. He says, Mad Scribe Games bows to Greg Gillespie. So you That's well, the book of my new books. So. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Greg, I, I just want to know, like, it, in Barrow Maze, when you when your uh, when you guy when your your group was going through that. Um, how, how did the sledgehammers come up? Like, is that something that came from your players? Is that something that, that you started? Well, what I do is uh, I'm a historian by trade. So anytime I do a project, I'm digging through archaeology books. I'm digging through uh, period books. Um, I'll draw inspiration from almost anywhere. And I was going through some ancient Egyptian uh, tombs looking for inspiration. And I found uh, a photograph of an archaeologist standing beside a bricked up entranceway into a crypt. And, and then I thought, you know, everything with, with Dungeons and Dragons has to have for the, the blade cuts both ways. For every positive, there's a negative, right? And so I was thinking, how can I mechanically make that work to uh, both environmentally within a crypt a, a, a silent crypt like dungeon and yet also make the give the players pause so then i was thinking okay well you know bricked up walls you're definitely going to need a sledgehammer for that sort of thing that's going to make noise noise is the last thing you want to make when you're in barrel maze uh so then it just became uh, okay well i'm going to connect this to turns um, relative to the number of players you're employing to break down the bricked up wall. And then it just seemed like a, a natural fit. And so the, the inspiration would came from history and, and a lot of the full page illustrations in my books, I can do a side by side with a historical uh, sketch or photograph alongside the inspiration that I've given to an artist to, uh, to make into the, the fantasy world. Okay, great. And then uh, we also we got a new subscriber, Brian Thomas. Thank you very much for subscribing to the channel. Avenger, what do you got? Um, let's see, two questions. Um, I guess why the undead? And the, it was the first question is kind of a two part. Like, why the undead? And was there any point where you were thinking instead of the undead, maybe you went with a different? like monster antagonist theme um and my other, the second question is so because you now have to deal with layout um did you do did you learn how to do the layout yourself or do you did you find someone to do that for you uh okay so the first question undead so if if we go back and we look at examples from mega dungeons uh, in the past, they, number one, they're just way too big. Um, if it's not reasonably completable, that's a problem. The other thing is that they, some can be fun houses with no coherence. So I wanted something, as I mentioned earlier, that was complete, ready to run out, like cover to cover. Then the other thing was I wanted something to hold it all together. Now, my parents are, are Scottish, so, uh, I've been to Scotland many times. I was always fascinated with burial mounds and barrows and uh, the treasures that could be uh, taken from them, um, the archaeology done, the lessons learned, that sort of thing. And it just seemed like a natural extension because in my mind's eye, I always start with a with uh, my imagination and I I just saw this this field of mist swept burial mounds where you could see, see the crown of one, but only maybe part of another, or a few standing stones here and there and fog, thick fog covering most of it. And I thought that's a really evocative thing. And, and then you go back and you go look at TSR stuff. They almost never used burial mounds. So I think I can find a couple examples that were maybe tucked in a dungeon as opposed to being the main sort of focus. So uh, I thought, well, that's, that's a real opportunity lost. I thought, and then you don't have to go very far. Like you'll, you don't have to go very far in England, Scotland, or, or Ireland to trip over a burial mound or a set of standing stones. So they're just ubiquitous across the landscape. And so I thought, like, so, like, I, they're, they're really evocative. And then when you get into it and you study the history and archaeology of it, you know, a lot of these things were aligned to the agrarian cycle, the phases of the moons. And that's, that's, that's when the veil between this world and other world thins. 
right? The the space is where you would you would put a one of your ancestors on a pyre and you would literally watch their sparks trickle up into the heavens and you're looking up saying prayers to your father from what we the later Christianity would steal, right? Looking up at the sky and and uh, and thanking your father. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are just really fascinating. They're they've got a lot of mysticism. They're evocative, and so that just lent itself burial mounds and undead. And then um, you just sort of uh, it, pushing and pulling that theme in, in different ways. Uh, I thought uh, would make uh, and, and and undead are are sort of scary. Like you know, if you're an older player, okay, you're into some skeletons. Well, that's not all that scary. But but you can if they're set within an environment when the when the environment becomes an NPC, that's what I'm really interested in. So the players have to have to work the environment working against them before they even enter the dungeon, and that's that's another thing that sets the suspense and the tone for for Barrowman, At least I hope it does. And then the last part uh, layout. So I'm I'm really uh, layout stupid for the most part. So I had a, a great person, Corey Hamill, who did the uh, layout for me and some did a lot of the art in uh, Barrowman's Complete. And he also did uh, Archaea. And then um, since then, Rocky Gardner, he, he did Highfell for me. And we've also done Drero Deep. And then with COVID and having the extra time at home, I've also spent a lot, a lot of time with design as well. And the logic of design just baffles me at times relative to other programs that, that I'm accustomed to using. So it, uh, it's uphill, it's an uphill uh, sledding for me, uh, but I've gotten a little bit better at it. So a few comments here from the, the audience um, on that, especially on what you were just talking about here, Greg. Uh, Chris Miller says, I love the fact that Greg incorporated real world archaeological experiences in his dungeons. Too many adventures rely too much on magic and suspension of disbelief for dungeon design. Uh, Joe the Lawyer says, Dungeons must make sense to me. I can't stand Funhouse style. Half the fun is trying to figure out... Sorry, Avenger. Half the fun is trying to figure out the next area based on what you've already seen of it. Um, and Charles Smith says, Does Greg have suggestions on finding, adapting historic sources into game content for people who aren't historians but are interested in adding those inspirations, history for gamers? So I'll, I'll add to that that, um, you know, uh, my my thing in the OSR, well, one of my things is is medieval authentic. You know, Lion and Dragon is is I'm medieval sorry. authentic RPG, and and all of my RPG Butter Presents stuff and the old school companion adventures. Um, I made a point in the adventures and locations I was de designing for Dark Albion, Sword and Caravan, and the the, the Pundit Presents adventures um, that that none of them can look like a TSR dungeon, because a TSR dungeon doesn't look like, well, most of them, I mean, don't like the standard D&D dungeon, doesn't look like anything that actually ever existed in history, right? Like, they, they don't. <laughs> they're, they're just these weird complexes um, that were not part of anything, um, of any actual historical source. So, you know, like in Dark Albion, for example, there's, there's, um, there are dungeons type scenarios, but they're either like, um cave complexes or barrow mounds or um roman type catacombs or you know ruined mm -hmm. buildings with ruined temples or things like that you know and i think that that adds a, a, an interesting kind of challenge to a designer uh whether or not they do like a lot of research into the like history because i do have like you know i've got the tower of the mad astrologer the castle the keep that's there which is probably the, the best. I'm not a very good dungeon designer, but it's probably the best dungeon I designed in any of my books. Um, the Tower of the Mad Astrologer, that castle is based on a real castle in Wales, right? Um, but, and so that makes it interesting. But but you could just do that without that. And and you can, um, and it ends up giving it a very, it, it's it's a similar experience of dungeon crawling, but it gives it a very different flavor, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, I, Greg, do you have uh, suggestions for Charles Smith about... Uh, historical sources for game content? Well, um, first let me speak, I'll go just quickly go down the list. So with Chris's comment, uh, this is, I think Chris's comment speaks to why WotC sucks so hard um, because they are self-referential. They're self-referential in a way Star Wars is self-referential and that's why it sucks too. Um, you need mm -hmm. to go back 
to the medieval history or the pre prehistory. And you, and if you have an understanding of that, and you're pulling from those sources, you're going to keep your material more interesting and more fresh. It's not going to. Once fantasy becomes self-referential, it's just a circle jerk, and it becomes more fantastical and fantastical and it moves further away from its basis in the various medieval periods for example so i would say, totally in agreement with you Greg. I, totally, I agree with chris's comment i have a big problem with that as well so 100 percent um with joe's uh comment yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not really a big funhouse guy i can see it maybe in the context where it's set within uh, a specific type of dungeon that you want to run but but as a general rule i, I would agree I'd, I'd probably steer clear um and then uh charles comment um you can use anything uh you, it just has to be you can't shoehorn it in there it has to be a natural fit for so like if we're using the telescope right so you've got the telescope okay i want the dungeon to be about this it's going to look like this. It's drawing inspiration from these time periods. Then, and then you start reading in those. You have to make sure that it's a it's a fit to. So you can use the the microscope, and that's great. But make sure the microscope works in concert with the telescope, and that's when you'll get internal consistency with what you're doing. And I think that internal consistency speaks on, uh, off the page. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're of, we're of completely common ideas here on the the right um, the right source to look at for inspiration for RPGs. Because if all you're reading is like Forgotten Realms novels, then like you said, all you're doing is you're 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 going on this this um, little train that goes around in circles. You know, <laughs> it doesn't doesn't achieve anything. Go back to the sources, and the sources are ancient myth and legend. You know, That's and it. history. Yeah, and history. Yeah, one hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. And and you know, this is like you can see it. It not only comes out on like when stuff becomes self-referential. It's not all. It don't. It, it not only comes out on the page. It comes out in the art, right? So then you're looking at the stuff going. That's not even reasonable. I can recall going to Scotland when I was about fifteen, and I tried to pick up a two-handed sword. I'm not. I'm, I'm over six. I'm almost six foot five. Well over two hundred pounds. And I could not get the tip of the two-handed sword off the ground. And so when I see these like, you know, massive swords and stupid armor with spikes and all that stuff, it just, it breaks the frame for me. And I, I can't, I, I don't think it has limited appeal. Let me put it that way. Yeah. What, one question. Um, so when you said you compared like the, the self-referential stuff uh, and you mentioned Star Wars, are you talking about like the more recent like Disney Star Wars, or are you yeah. actually talking about the original Star Wars, which I believe um, borrowed a lot from history and myths, legends, etc. Yeah, I, I think I think the parallel between that and Dungeons and Dragons is is uh, spot on in that D and D poached from everywhere, but in its first iterations, it was new, and it looked like it had a history, right? especially when you were young you're reading it for the first time like we're all we're all these wondrous magic items coming from that are named and they have backstory and things like that and but then but then after a while um the vision closes and it doesn't reference pulp fantasy anymore it's self-referential and that's where you get into the problem um when because the earth early uh D, D didn't have an aesthetic like when they depicted wizards, they just de depicted the wizard that would show up and do magic tricks at a, a kid's party with a conical sort of hat and moons and stars on it because they didn't know what else to do, right? And now it's just gone off. It's just way far from the original source material, whether it's myth, legend, history, or what have you. And I just, it has, I just think it, it only takes you so far to me. Absolutely. I would add one more thing to, to Charles Smith. There are some books that were made specifically for RPGs. The one that's coming to mind right now is, um, oh, what was it, by Palladium, the, the Palladium Book of Weapons and Castles. And uh, so that, 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 for example, I remember looking at that when I was like a teenager, probably. And uh, it was, it was uh, quite good because it had 
you know, actual layouts and details about real castles, you know, real medieval castles and, and maps of that. And so that can be a, a good place to start if you don't want to, like, look at, you know, some kind of, um, <laughs> you know, you don't want to you don't want to take a history degree just to be able to, to understand what you're doing, you know. Um, and I, I'm sure there are a few other source books of those kinds that are that are either made specifically for RPGs or that are made kind of for the general public. And that's that's if you don't if you're not a historian um, or some other kind of, you know, academic with the right context, then that's probably a good place to start. You know, mm -hmm. and any place is a good place to start when you're not sure. But if you have an idea and you're wondering, you're thinking about, OK, well, you know, uh, mounds were, were made during a particular time period. I'm going to focus and learn more about that time period. And that will lead to other readings. It'll lead to uh, archaeological digs. It will lead to documentaries. Um, whatever, you know, whatever medium you learn best from, do that. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Greg, what, um, what mega dungeons did you get inspiration from when you were working on Bear Maze and, and subsequent works? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, um, you know, like most of the box set um, Mega Dungeons made by TSR. Like Under Mountain. Uh, and... Under Mountain, yeah, and uh, Mithranor and, and others. But uh, like, again, I would say um, I, I took more from, from what I didn't like, what I didn't want to do. Uh, and rather than, than looking at something and say, wow, this is exactly the way I want to do it. I just... I wanted to make the dungeons that I wanted Mithranor to be, that I wanted the ruins of Zental Keep to be, that I wanted Undermountain to be, and weren't. Uh, I, I think I enjoyed the Undermountain modules more than I did the actual box sets, because they were just basically maps and tables, and it was just it didn't have anything to hold it together, and and that those were the the main criticisms. And then in addition to that you couldn't really play it out of the box without a great deal of prep. And people have less prep time today than they did back then with the, the, the internet and social media and video games and so on and so forth. So I just felt that um, this needed to be something that was uh, right out of the box, um, evocative in its tone and environment and was realistically com completable for a dedicated group of gamers. Okay, and then, uh, sub, uh, sorry, but I just had one follow up on that, and, and then that was uh, Greg. Uh, 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 are there any particular designers that that uh, inspired you as well when you were working? On I keep going back to Baramaze because Baramaze, I think, is just amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I wouldn't say I don't have any one uh, inspiration, like um, Steve Perrin, for example. He he wrote the first Forgotten Realms module called Under Ilfarn, and uh, or Under Ilfarn, and um, uh, it like wasn't great at the end of the day. Um, the module part was actually pretty. The, the dungeon crawling part was pretty short, but I did take inspiration from how the town was laid out, how he uh, laid out the um, the uh, profile heads for the NPCs with the material underneath. And you, you can see a bit of that lineage in the way I laid out the town section and NPC section for, mm. for Baromaze. But um, like I, I'm, I'm not a box text person. If, if, you, if you are looking down, reading box text to a group of humans at the table, and, you're, and you're, most people read monotone, so they don't read dramatically. They're not method reading. So that's boring as hell. And if you're not making eye contact with players, now you've made the game very impersonal. So I wanted to keep the descriptions as short as I could to communicate what the, what the person running the game needed to know and absolutely no more. So that's how I, how I wanted to go about it. Of course, more complex rooms need a little bit more uh, fleshing out and, and information, but, but trying to keep it simple. I think D&D is best when it's simple. Um, it doesn't need to be complex for you to roll dice and wave swords and have some jokes with your friends. Um, and I think, I think it's simplicity 
is the the real sweet spot for for enjoying the game. Um, that just my my two cents. All right. So some comments here from the live chat. Joe, the lawyer, says, "I have most of your books, pundit. Good stuff. I like the historical accuracy. Thank you, Joe." Um, Joe the lawyer also says, uh, the youngsters don't read fantasy literature. They have no points of reference. Uh, they know the cla they don't know the classics of literature, so they don't know what makes a good story. Mm -hmm. uh, Sad Wings Raging comes here late, and he says, Venger, my man. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> Dracopole <laughs> says, cut out video games and Netflix and social media. Produce, don't consume. Well, that's true, but uh, another point is that in on the internet, um, you know, it's so much easier. If you were if you were trying to research stuff for uh, an RPG campaign or to write an RPG product that was like historically or mythically based in like the 90s, it was so much harder, right? Because now, like, let's say you don't have any kind of academic degree or something like that, but you want to, I don't know, you're trying to learn about the Hundred Years' War, right? You just start looking up stuff on the internet and you go along you know, clicking on links and you're going to find stuff and you and, and as long as you put in the work of reading that stuff, you're going to learn, you know, you can educate yourself in a way that you couldn't before. So it's about, you know, uh, stop using the stupid parts of the Internet and use the Internet as a way to educate yourself as a tool for learning. Right. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, okay. Bill Griggs says D&D &D is best when the cool stuff comes from the players instead of instead of from the characters, I assume you mean from the NPCs. Um, okay, so now you're, you've, you've produced your newest product, Duero Deep. From what I understand, it's been a, a you had a successful Kickstarter. Um, it's it's doing very well, obviously on in in you know sales on drive through. It bumped me to fourth place, so <laughs> so obviously it's doing well. It bumped well, it bumped it bumped me and Chris Miller because he's my publisher. But anyway, uh, so you. Um, but you had an incident. And before we get to that incident, um, my impression of you, because obviously, you know, you might know that I have been very involved in RPG culture wars for a very long time, since before there was wokists or SJWs. And uh, obviously, I've been fighting them very vocally, especially in these last, you know, whatever, whatever it'd be now, uh, six or seven years. Um, and there are some other people in the OSR, including you know, the other two guys that are, that are the, the hosts of this show, but other people as well, who have been doing the same. And then there are some people that have obviously, you know, that, that have taken the, the, the woke Kool-Aid. Um, but there's a few people in, in the OSR that are, you know, to me, were always kind of notorious for um, not getting involved in that, right? For just, you know, they produce their books, they don't say anything. And the two of them, like if you had asked me uh, uh, six months ago, you know, name a couple of people in the OSR that you don't really, that don't really make any statements on, you know, cultural or political um, conflicts, I would have said, oh, well, Kevin Crawford and Greg Gillespie, right? <laughs> uh, except that you made a, what, what I think was a pretty innocuous sort of um, position to take in, in, in this Kickstarter that you did for Duero Deep. And suddenly you got brigaded by by Wokus. So do you want to do you want to tell us about that? And also, you know, if I'm wrong and you you commented on this sort of stuff before and I just somehow missed it, you can feel free to correct me. But I, I had always been in the impression that like, like you were kind of like minding your own business in the OSR world until suddenly they decided to target you. And so now you're you've suddenly said, well, screw it. Now I'm going to I'm going to say what I think. Right. <laughs> but uh, but tell us your story about this. Sure. Well, you're right. Uh, that's the short version. I um, I've endeavored to um, to steer clear uh, of that sort of thing online. However, um, given uh, I, I'm about uh, imbalance. So, for example, if I'm dealing with students, I want to attack their weaknesses and build on their strengths. And when I stand back and I look at the direction of society in North America, um, we're increasingly led by uh, uh, an extremist political viewpoint that is unhealthy for our broader society, in my opinion. 
And from that standpoint, I, I don't agree with it. And you have to understand, as someone that worked for the university, I'm at ground zero. Uh, universities are where this stuff <laughs> came from. Um, universities are the breeding ground from which this has filtered out since the 1990s. And I didn't agree with it then. I don't agree with it now. Having said that, um, this is the time where reasonable people need to stand up and be heard uh, so that the discussions, the uh, freedom of language, the freedom of speech, and in my, in my field, freedom of inquiry uh, are curtailed in the name of a political ideology. So it's important for me to be able to speak personally and professionally when I think there's an imbalance and there's an absolute uh, imbalance. So getting specific to what you were asking about. So in my Kickstarter for Duero Deep, I wrote, if you enjoy an adventure steeped in the history and lore of the game, medieval fantasy, dwarves and Anglo-Saxon history, and the woke, woke nonsense, this will be right up your alley. And quite honestly, that's an innocuous uh, phrase to me because I'm not doing anything different with Dwero Deep than I did with Highfell before that, than I did with Archaea before that, or Barrowmaze before that. It's about good gaming. And I'm not shoehorning um, identity politics or any kind of politic into my game other than what would make for an awesome dungeon crawl experience? So, like, I don't, I didn't understand the brouhaha that came from that because I, I haven't changed. I haven't done anything different. I'm doing exactly what I've done for over 10 years now. So, it's just, you know, we've got a group of uh, people who, um, if you, you know, speak against their religion, will brand you an apostate. And because you're not going to bend the knee, I'm definitely going to be one of those people. This is how I feel about it, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to be unapologetic. Um, there, you know, I just think wokeness is informed by things I despise, like uh, Marxism, like critical race theory, like uh, intersectional feminism. I'm for feminism, but it's not intersectional feminism. So I just see a, a big power imbalance in the culture war and uh it needs to write itself and that's the long and the short of it for me excellent so um in in this situation with with duro deep i thought it was really interesting the part that i found the most funny and maybe you didn't find it that funny because you were the target right but but um the part I found most most hilarious about the wokest reaction is that what they were, what they they focused on at least on Twitter. What I saw there, you know, I'm I'm very, very much a Twitter warrior. Um, they were commenting because you had said that one of the influences, let's say, of of Duro Deep was Anglo-Saxon history and culture, right? And and you, uh, you got that just enraged them. You know, it absolutely enraged the wokest. And there were some of them that were saying there's no such thing as an Anglo-Saxon culture, right? The Anglo-Saxon yeah. culture doesn't exist because, you know, I guess because white people don't have a culture or something like that. You know, I don't know what they were thinking, but uh, it just made them furious to 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 say. And, and this is a thing that I've been, you know, facing uh, occasionally with my own products because, you know, I've done historically authentic products that are based on real historical cultures. And of course, you know, Lion and Dragon, Dark Albion, those are based on medieval Europe. But I also did Arrows of Indra, which is based on, you know, epic, epic India from the, the Mahabharata and the Indian myths. And now I've got Sword and Caravan, which is a very historically accurate and culturally accurate depiction of the Middle East and the Silk Road in the at the end of the 12th century. You know, and and uh, so I haven't seen anyone actually attack Sword and Caravan yet, right? But certainly Arrows of Indra and uh, you know um, Lion and Dragon and Dark Albion were were um, being attacked on issues. Uh, you know, in the case of Arrows of Indra, uh, how how can I, as 
you know, a white person who happens to have, you know, massively studied Indian culture and, and religion and history, you know, especially Indian myth, um, because it's one of my academic areas, right? Um, how can I possibly write something because I'm not, you know, because I'm not Indian, right? Because I'm not East Indian. I, I, I don't, you know, you can't be qualified to do that. Uh, and then on the other hand, in, you know, Lion and Dragon and stuff like that, and the European stuff, it's like, well, you can't make an RPG about that because you're not representing people who, who are who weren't from Europe in the Middle Ages, you know. So it's just crazy to me. Um, well, and anyways, I, I thought it was very funny that you know at, at this point we've gotten to where some people are like literally trying to deny the existence of Anglo-Saxon history or culture. I know. I, love I, I, I use this, I use the same. I the so I'll I'll just use their logic and turn it against them. Being Anglo-Saxon is one of my immutable characteristics. It can't, you can't hand wave it. You can't wave your wand and make it go away. It, it is who I am. Um, the other part too is everybody, like most of these people have no basic understanding of human history. So if King Harold won the Battle of Hastings in 1066, we wouldn't be sitting here having a conversation using English. We would be sitting here having a conversation speaking Wait for it, Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, these people just don't read. They they just come up with superficial, off-the-cuff comments because they're clueless. So yeah. you know, I don't. Uh, if someone wants to declare themselves that they want to go sit over at the kitty table rather than sitting at the adult table, that's perfectly fine. They can do that, but you just make it easier. To, to deal with you when you speak like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. As long as they don't talk to the other children about uh, the radical gender theory and, uh, <laughs> you know, their sex lives and uh, whatever else. Drag shows. Well, you know, the, you, uh, okay, Venger, Venger said it in a... It, in, in a particularly venture way, right? But it is a problem is that a lot of these people are what you could call midwits, right? And midwits are people who are not going to really be able to make, you know, the, the, the ones that are really clever parasites can get a career writing about critical theory or something like that, you know, or, or become, you know, woke, um, you know, woke activists that uh, use their victimhood status to make money. But the vast majority of these people are basically useless for almost anything and nobody really wants to listen to what they have to say. And so a, a, a huge percentage of them become public education teachers in K to 12, you know, and then therefore can can spread their bullshit to a captive audience of infants, you know. And uh, that's a that's a real serious problem, you know, the, the education system, because by the time they get to university, they're already fucked up now, you know, like there's no. Yeah, you, know, you could have the best university professors in the world, and we don't, as a rule, right? Ninety percent of the university professors are are a disaster too. Um, but you know, even if you had good ones, you couldn't. You, you, by that point, you were already swimming against the tide of eighteen years. You know. No, I know very well. I've taught first year students for twenty years, and uh, watching that deterioration over that time time period in skill level. Um, intellectual ability, uh, you're really, you're building more from scratch than you are uh, at any other point in, in my professional uh, career. We had a super chat here from Joe, the lawyer who gave us 499. Thank you, Joe. But he had a question for Greg. He said, Greg, I am curious. What was the sales ratio between the fifth edition and OSR versions of Barrow Maze? It's an interesting question. Um, that's not stuff I look up on the regular. I'll be honest about it. I, between, um, trying to put out a new book, dealing with the layout, dealing with drive through, dealing with production delays, dealing with delivery, uh, <laughs> going back and looking at, at the old stuff, uh, for that kind of comparative is not something I really have the time to do. Um, without question, the OSR, it, I, I don't need to see anybody else's numbers to know that Barrow Maze is one of the most successful, if not the most successful OSR product ever. Um, it is always, its sales are always strong. And, and there's always people who, who just find it, you know, people who maybe cycle in and out of the hobby or uh, are picking it up because their kids are of age or something like that. So um, I, I don't have that answer. It's not something I would normally go and, and look up. 
Well, I, I don't know about Barrow Maze. Barrow Maze Complete on OS on, on drive through is apparently a platinum bestseller. So that's good. But of course, it's not the only edition of that. So you have to add up all the other ones, right? Um, mm -hmm. But Duero Deep, which has just come out, I can point out that um, in the OS hottest OSR list on drive through right now, Duero Deep is number one, and Duero Deep Fifth Edition is number three. So they're both doing very well, but it looks like at least on drive through like the OSR version is selling a little better than the Fifth Edition version. But I, I don't know if you're also selling them in other venues because that might affect it. No, I'm not. All right, so there you go. So with Duero Deep, at least the OSR version is still selling a little better than the, the fifth edition version. Um, I mean, I, I, you'd think that that would probably make sense because obviously you have a reputation within the OSR that 5e fans might not even know about, right? That they, they might not. Or, yeah, I mean, they might, they might not know how good the book is going to be, right? Because because they, uh, they, they're not familiar with, with your OSR history. Well, just to speak to that, you're right. Um, there were fifth edition people who were buying blind, and um, thank thank you for for you know giving me a a try. Um, based on the, you might be interested to know that uh, based on my that update that caused the uh, the hassle, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. three people uh, complained to the point where I gave them refunds, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and after that point, 14 people added because they were just happy that I said that the game would have no woke nonsense. Yeah, well, I can tell you, I've been attacked, brigaded in different ways by SJWs many, 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 many times over the last decade, right? And every single time that they do this, every single time they come after me, right? There's a guy last year who made a one-hour video about about me and some of the other OSR people and basically claimed, you know, used very specious arguments to claim that we were alt-right Yahtzees, you know? And mm -hmm. uh, after that, my sales spiked, right? And my my subscribers spiked, you know? like And every time it works out that way, every single time that they attack you, um, what you're, what what happens is if you stand your ground, right, They then you're going to have people that will rally to you. You know, it wasn't always as intensely like that, but it, it's more like that every time. It's gotten to the point now where it's like a Streisand effect, right? That, that especially in the last couple of years, um, any of their efforts to take one of us down ends up completely backfiring on them. So, but don't tell them that, you know, <laughs> please let, let them keep trying. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, like, uh, there's a segment of that group that has no it, no interest in debate. Uh, so, and, you know, normally if, uh, if someone doesn't like something I wrote online or something like that, and I meet them at a convention and we have a conversation, uh, we'll at the end of it, we're probably buying each other a beer and, and saying, you know, enjoy the rest of your, your convention or enjoy the rest of your game or, or whatever. But I think, you know, there's just a lot of people who, uh, who are, you know, come up with superficial sort of emotional responses. And when we're at the adult table, we need to uh, have some dialogue and have some discussion. And at the end of the day, we can disagree, but not be disagreeable. Uh, and that's been lost in in reasonable, mature uh, discussion, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. Venger, I know that you're going to have to, that's your bedtime soon. Uh, do you have any final questions or comments for Greg? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think we all learned a lot. and. Um... Yeah, all looks good. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Did you ever run Barrel Maze, Venger? Uh, nope. I picked up... Um, I think I picked up book two from my local half Price books. Um, I don't know, like four years ago. And that just went in the pile of cool things that one day soon I will pick up and start reading and um, hopefully be influenced by, but never actually got around to doing that because I'm just always so busy and I know I something else to pick up and, and look at or watch on TV or 
or a screen or, you know, writing, marketing, and- family, job. So, no, I, I, and I didn't have any, like... That's fair. That's fair. And Greg, have yeah. you ever uh, read or, or run Chalt or any Avengers other books? I don't actually read much that uh, my peers are, are doing. Um, I don't really want to be uh, influenced one way or the other. Uh, I, I have, um, when it comes to my own stuff, the first place I go is going to be, so if I have a question, the first thing I'm going to do is how did TSR attack it? And then I'm going to, I'm going to go through those examples and then say, did it, was it any good? Did it work? Did it not work? And then because any, any problem or issue that, that we run into TSR has already run into at least once. So I, I do give them, I try to give them respect and, and credit for their iterations over the decades. And um, I do try to go there first. And then if I'm not satisfied with a way they came up with something, then that's when I'll branch out into my own, into my own areas. And then after I do that, so I, I'll do, so for example, with Dwerody, I did a whole lit review through everything I could get my hands on, Dungeon, Dragon Magazine, TSR published modules, third-party stuff, anything related to dwarves that may have been in, in, you know, snuck in some article somewhere I read. And then it's a question of, do you like it? Do you not like it? Does it suit your taste? Does it suit the contemporary taste? Then from there, you're into your, uh, your, uh, your history sources, your archaeology sources, what can you pull from there? So we've had, you know, with, with every month, it seems like there's a new interesting uh, dig or find. I'm particularly interested in Gobekli Tepe right now in terms of, the, uh, you know, being one of some of the first human temples, uh, it would seem. So, yeah. you know, I, I keep my eye on that sort of thing. And then and then I try to merge the literature. So with the example of Dwerdi, um, if we if you we think of Moria in in Fellowship of the Ring as as the first, as the the prototypical dungeon from which all other dungeons spawn, um, that that ground was never really covered by by TSR, that that sweet spot between Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons. So you you want to have the feel and the evocative suspense and atmosphere of Moria and the melancholy of Moria but at the same time, it has to be gameable at the table and fun and cool to play. And finding that sweet spot between those two things is what I was hoping to accomplish. That's a very good point. We got a couple of comments here. Sad Wings Raging says, oh, come on, who doesn't want to be groomed by Benger? <laughs> and uh, Chris Miller has just done a, another um, super chat for $5. He says, check out uh, Anchor. Kingdom of the Gods, was it? I think I'm, I, I I lost it now. But uh, And uh, the new Sword and Caravan book. The Sword and Caravan book, that's that's my own book, which is uh, adventures in the during the Third Crusade and on the Silk Road for uh, any OSR product, but of course, especially for Lion and Dragon. Um, I got some more questions for Greg, but since Venger's still here, maybe we should just jump over and do the shill real quick. Yeah, let's do the shilling before Venger has to yeah. disturb. And I guess Venture can go first because yeah, I think I'll he's going to have to go first. Okay, Venture. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, in just, uh, I don't know, like three weeks, I guess, uh, VentureCon is starting. Um, so for those who don't know, it's, um, it's the very first convention, gaming convention that I'm running. And it's exclusively old school, OSR, traditional role-playing games. Uh, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th of July, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's going to be a good time. Uh, I'm going to be there running the, running the shit out of things, mostly Chalt. Uh, a lot of other people are going to be there. Um, there's going to be Anchor, um, role-playing game there. And, um, Sounds fun. I got that Avenger. I got the AvengerCon up there and I also got the Crystal Utopia, Rainbow oh, Crystal yeah. Utopia, by the way. Right. Um, so hopefully by the end of next week, uh, that might be up on Drive Through RPG again, uh, in a slightly edited form. But if you want to get it before then, um, 
uh, not this last blog post, but I think the one before that, I talked about um, details on how you can order it for me direct. Just pay me through PayPal and I will send you the PDF and then you'll have it. It's my own alternative pride Schultz scenario. And it's really good. 18 pages, $3. Uh, yeah, I encourage everybody to get it. And then I think that's it. All right. Who's next, Joe? You're up, Pundit. Oh, me. Yeah. Okay. I got Soren Caravan right. up for you. Okay. Good job, by the way. And um, I'll see you guys later. Hey, bro. Uh, nice to see you, Greg. Hey, Cheers. And yeah, that's it. Then you're out. All right. So Sword and Caravan, still on the top five of the, the OSR bestsellers list on DriveThru. Now also available on Amazon uh, in paperback or hardcover. If you want it on PDF, you have to get it through DriveThru, I believe. I don't know if I'm wrong about that. I guess Chris can correct me. But um, Sword and Caravan is Medieval Adventures on the Silk Road. It's a 200-page um, setting and source book filled with all kinds of uh, gazetteer information, including magnificent looking hex maps of the entire region of the the holy land and the silk road all the way from from damascus to to the border of china um lots and lots of random tables and mechanics and things that you can use in your uh in your osr campaign most of it is system neutral and uh you are not going to be disappointed the interior not but that i am not responsible for that is all on mad scribe games they've done an amazing, amazing job, probably the most beautiful uh, book that I've published, that I have written. Um, and that says a lot because, you know, Dark Albion and Lion and Dragon are really pretty too. Um, so you're, you're, you're going to love the look of it and you're going to love the content. Uh, be sure to check it out. You can get it on, on DriveThru. You can get it for um, $39.99 on softcover, $49.99 hardcover. Um, or you, with a little bit more, you can do a combo uh, for with either of those with the PDF. So uh, the PDF is fourteen ninety nine, I think, by itself. So be sure to check that out. Also, check out from Spectre Press. We, there's finally a new issue of uh, RPG Funded Presents out. RPG Funded Presents number one hundred and seven, I believe, if I'm not <laughs> if I'm not remembering that wrong. Uh, the Northman Sigils, which is a complete system of uh, a new type of uh, magic, which is uh, runic magic that uh, you can use based on the historically authentic um, magical tradition of the, well, the uh, Germanic people, uh, the Northern Europeans. Um, it has uh, all of the mechanics of it and how to use it. It's 15 pages long on PDF, 299. You can adapt that system to any OSR game. And of course, it's especially suited to the Lion and Dragon RPG. So uh, be sure to check that out too. And uh, I guess that's it for me. And besides that, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and check out all my other RPG Funded Presents products and my, uh, and my other books. I'll leave it at that, Job. All right, I guess I'm up. I'm real, I'll be real fast. Uh, still selling Book of Antitheses. Uh, so head out to us.lotfp.com. Got a couple copies left. And uh, some of my adventures you can get off of uh, bloodyhammergames.com. Just out there. At, uh, with a demon idol um, and some other bullshit. Okay, you're up, Greg. How about <clears throat> It's all you, Greg. I got Duero Deep and a link to the DTRPG page. Sure. Um, I also uh, brought. Uh, all right. So there you see it. There you see the cover there. So uh, this cover was actually done three years ago. This was um, by uh, a friend of mine, Scott Lemien, who has done a lot of art for the other uh, books that that I've done, and. Um, we we did a little variation on the the fade on the back so you see the the, the change from the purple to the green or to the blue to the green and i thought that was a that was a fun little um aesthetic choice so the the book comes in about 336 pages one hundred and forty thousand words and uh i took a lot of inspiration from you know, you guys may recall 
at the back of the DM guide, there was uh, there was sort of like three or four four um, bottom of the page illustrations that showed sort of a party at low level fighting kobolds, and then the same party fighting I think it was trolls, and then so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So what I did was I wanted to do something where um, where I had that running through the substantive portions of the adventure. So I did, a, I think it was 150 unique, uh, what I call them zipatomes, or basically illustrations at the gutter, uh, on the gutter of the page. Uh, and they each relate to the content of the page. <clears throat> so that's really exciting. I got a chance to work with uh, Larry Elmore, who contributed, uh, Jeff D, Darlene, uh, Diesel, um, and Tim Truman again. So that was really exciting. So they're all in the book. And then I recently did, uh, uh, I'm working on the, a monochrome uh, cover as well with uh, a forward by Ed Greenwood. So um, you can anticipate that coming in the, in the next uh, couple months. All right. So uh, some comments from the chat before we continue because we've got to catch up with these. Mm -hmm. um, Paul says, just because you leave SJWs alone doesn't mean they'll leave you alone. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, Malachi's Mercurial Musing says, it's not the politics of a person, but how they push their views on others. Mm -hmm. um, Legion of Myths says, do not ignore SJWs, confront them, stop them. When they re, re louder and create better products, drown them out, shut them up, push them back into obscurity. Well, Trackable, I, sorry. Can I, can I just jump in there for a minute? Yep, go ahead. Speaking quickly to that point, uh, there are different ways of going about it. Uh, yes, you can confront people with silly views directly. Uh, the other part of it, you can you can speak through your published product. So a lot of these people, quite honestly, as far as I'm concerned, are tourists. Will they be around in the hobby five years from now? I doubt it. And if you just do what you do, you keep your head down, you maintain the um, your imagination, your interest and your your discipline and you continue to do what you do you're going to put forward your vision uh in in your um in your adventures and that ultimately speaks at the end of the day so these people who are creating stuff that's rife with identity politics where they're basically just trying to lecture you uh that has a limited scope it has a limited range and they're also entrenching themselves in their moment. And if you want to make something that's an instant classic, that has long-term value, don't situate yourself in any particular movement or time period. That will allow your work to, to be universal and it will transcend time. Yeah, well, I would certainly say if you're not producing something, so if all you're doing is shouting back, if you're not producing something, then you're, you're, you know, you, you might, maybe you're, you're, you're providing a counter to their shouting, but it, it doesn't actually resolve the bigger issue. And I think that's a problem that the people who are kind of opposed to the, to the new left took quite a while to figure out. And it took guys like, like Chris Rufo, for example, to really get the depth of it in what he calls um, Gramscian conservatism, right? That we have to, it's not enough to just shout back at them or deny them or something like that, or to like try to do some kind of big sweeping gestures. It doesn't matter that much. I mean, it does matter, obviously, as we've seen in the last little while, who's the president of the United States, but um, that by itself is not enough to change things, right? You have to change things by creating an entire um, viable alternative concept of culture, concept of lawmaking, concept of, of institutions, um, and aggressively re redo, you know, reverse the march through the institutions, you know, because if you don't do that, then then it doesn't matter how loud you're shouting, they're they're also winning because they're infiltrating and subverting everything that we that we value, you know. Um, yeah, I get it. but you know, at the end of the day, the ideology that informs our perspective is a mile wide and but only an inch deep. And when you use their heuristic against them, their ideology falls apart. It's untenable. So, yes. so the key thing to understand is 
So know, know, know where that ideology comes from, know its intellectual origins, understand why they're expressing things the way they're expressing them, understand the linguistic games that they're playing in an attempt to corner you or to, to corner your perspective. And then you need to respond you need to counter those claims with reasonable arguments that make them look silly. And when you do that over time, eventually that will bear itself out because people yeah. will see it, they'll read it, and you, it'll make sense and they won't. You know that they're making use of postmodernist concepts about the control of narrative and specifically Foucault's concept of semantics as the basis of all power, right? So if they get to define what words mean and you accept those definitions, they've already won from the beginning, right? So one of the key things that you have to do is um, not just refuse to, to, to accept their um, semantic games, their, their redefinition of words, um, but, but invert that and use it against them, right? This is why they hate it when you call them groomers, right? Because you're, you're using the same tactics they do, but you're flipping it back to reverse the, the default um, the fundamental assumption of the logical argument, because if, if they now they start by saying we're not groomers, they've already they've already lost, right? They've they've accepted the argument of the question becoming not are are you a racist or not, but rather are they uh, groomers who are perverting children or not? You know, like so that's why you know like the the, the election in Virginia was won by Chris Rufo making that argument about about. Uh, you know, uh, gender theory and about CRT and reversing it into changing them into saying, well, you know, you guys are racist, you guys are segregationists, you guys are groomers. <laughs> so yeah. there, there's value to doing that. But uh, well, well, once that happens, if you just do that and stop, then then you that still doesn't fix anything unless you're also producing stuff. So I know that not everybody can make, you know, in the context of our hobby, not everyone can write an RPG product, right? But but if you if you can, if you have one in mind, you should do that because that's also a contribution. If you make an RPG product that's for gaming, because none of theirs are, all of theirs are primarily for the ideological. pushing of an ideological point, right? Their propaganda. Um, mm. And so every product you make that's for gaming and that gamers will be able to find and use and play for gaming, that's going to be a victory against them. And that's why they're so mad at people like, like Greg and myself, right? <laughs> that uh, we make products that are for gaming. I kind of, on that, I kind of disagree, for example, with the tactic Venger has where he makes products that are counter propaganda, you know? Because <laughs> uh, that, you know, like, and as you said, those are so topical that, you know, in, in four months, they're not going to be relevant anymore, you know? Yeah. Whereas Barrel Maze is, is still relevant now and it's going to be relevant 20 years from now. And so are, so is Lion and Dragon, right? And and uh, any of those other, anything Kevin Crawford made, you know, all of those are going to be relevant in the long term. Yeah, um, I completely agree with you. Yeah. And the other part, you know, you have to understand that uh, when you hear stuff, so so they'll, they'll try to play semantic games to to give you no option in response. So, so words are harm. And silence is violence. Yeah, exactly. And so they play these games so that you are not provided an opportunity for a response. And you need to know how to respond intellectually when they do that, because they will. The people will do it, they'll do it online, they'll do it personally, they'll do it professionally. And if you have reasonable responses to those kinds of silly critiques, then, then you're away to the races. And that takes, you know, you have to invest yourself in it to know, know, the, know how to respond in these kinds of situations. And, and uh, but I think at the end of the day, the best way to go about it is um, you you can't you can't can only give naysayers uh, so much credit. Like so I, I went through my academic training was was really confrontational and hardcore. And there is nothing really anybody can say about me in the RPG hobby that will remotely come close to the painful uh, critical commentary I got from my mentors and, and colleagues as I went through my grad studies. So at the end of the day, uh, I, you know, I've heard cutting criticism. Um, you need to understand anytime you hear a criticism, you need to think about it in, in very real terms. Then you need to think about where is it coming from and contextualize that criticism. 
And then from those two points, you can say to yourself, ah, okay, somebody is saying something I need to internalize, or they're saying, or, or it's just coming from an ideological standpoint, and they're not going to agree with anything I say. And quite often, that's the case with the group that you're talking about. Yeah. Well, Chris Miller says in the live chat, he says, the left attacks me, a white man, for writing books about uh, Middle East or Africa, even though I know much more than most about the history of those places and cultures. Well, that's that's one of the elements of the that of critical race theory, this idea that somebody's skin color comes with a magical power to be capable of interpreting a culture and, and uh, even the history of a culture, right? The yeah. counter argument that I wrote about that years ago on my blog was with the, you know, fake example of... Um, uh, what was it, Klaus Werner von Kraut Angelou, right? The 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 grandson, the 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 three quarters German grandson of Maya Angelou, you know, that uh, that's lived all of his life in Germany, only speaks German, has been surrounded by Bavarians, right? But to the left, they would assume that Klaus Werner von Kraut Angelou would have uh, would have more of a right to comment on contemporary Black culture or historical African culture than say an entirely uh, European descended white professor who has studied African studies for 30 years, you know, and who is who specialized, I don't know, in the history of Great Zimbabwe or something like that, you know, like that guy is unqualified because of his, his genetics, right? This is a genetic based theory that they have. I know, it's so unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I, I got a question for Greg, if I can interrupt. <laughs> well, I look for um, comment on. Greg, where's my question? Oh, here we go. You probably don't remember me giving you a hard time uh, back in the G plus days, but I have the same criticism today, which is, uh, are you ever gonna do an offset print of any of your, your books? Because the, everything about the, the layout, the art, everything about your books is amazing, except print on demand books look like shit. So you ever please think about doing an offset print and like kickstart it something? Is that something that's in the works for you? Well, uh, I'm a bit hamstrung from a logistical standpoint being in Canada. So the only way I could possibly do that would be if it was printed, constructed and printed uh, in the U.S. Of course, most of most of the folks that are buying a drive through, not all, of course, but most are, are in the United States. So if, if it was created in the US and uh, was available for shipping without international shipping costs, then yes, that would be, that would be viable. But given, how, given the, uh, how pricey international shipping costs are uh, and the weight of some of my books, I couldn't produce and ship them from Canada and make it uh, in the, in, even in the ballpark of what my books cost now. So, so that's really, that's the logistical part of it that I'm hamstrung by being out, being in Canada. You know, what I love to do, like great, like a you know, leather bound barrel maze book with a cool skull and boss in the front. Absolutely. What I, I would yeah, for sure. Some big posters <laughs> printed out with all the maps. That'd be amazing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, just right here, actually, I've got, um, so this is this is the um, the hex map Ooh. for Groby. Nice. Wow. That looks amazing. This I is a that this printed out. You just printed it out yourself. Yeah. So that's eighteen by twenty four, and that poster is available in black and old school blue in the in the uh, in PDF. So it's really really sweet a lot of time and effort went into making that as cool uh, a map as i could here's another poster map from the same project nice that looks cool that's great <laughs> i like the classic tsr yeah, colors there yeah i always do an old school blue just because you know i think it's fun and then people can choose whether they want to work with the black or they want to work with the old school blue and then um yeah i know you put up the cover uh, this is the, this is the uh, monochrome. monochrome. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, Very it's cool. just a good pleasure of mine. That's all. That looks great. All right. So, 
Charlotte Williams says, thanks for letting me know about this channel I sub to and click the bell to for starting a live stream on YouTube. I could have used the notification earlier. Well, you can't rely on YouTube, unfortunately. Uh, you need to keep your eyes open. Uh, Charlotte, I, if you subscribe to my channel and, uh, you know, I, I, said, I always post um, announcements in the, you know, like, uh, what are they called? um posts uh, youtube posts announcing when there's going you know a day before when there's going to be a an inappropriate characters uh, episode um so that might help but uh you can also you should also check out i don't know if you're on twitter or on miwi or on minds uh in any of those or or if you follow rpg pundit on facebook i always post beforehand letting people know when the uh, the next episode is coming up so uh, maybe some of those will help. Uh, community posts. That's right. Thank you, Sadwins. Okay, and we got a new sub, Crafty Matt. Thank you for subscribing. And uh, Greg, I got another follow-up question for you about how to give you more money. Uh, bear, we're gonna get a Barrel Maze T-shirt. That T-shirt's awesome. Thanks. I uh, so I was a metal fan, um, and I have you know that first wave of British heavy metal. So I I did um, a couple T-shirts. Um, so this one's like Motorhead, the, the right, font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then uh, I did another one that has uh, Barrel Maze, like the Metallica logo. So uh, those are just on T Public. Um, so you can punch in Barrel Maze into T Public, and um, it'll bring up my uh, my little storefront. <laughs> it's called the Owl Bear Fur Company, and uh, it's just a fun thing. Like really. Yeah, I only make like two bucks a t-shirt. I just did it because I want I wanted the t-shirts and I thought it was fun. And I like to I like um, mashups, like you know, taking Barrow Maze and doing it like in a heavy metal concert t-shirt. So just a little bit of fun. Nice. All right. Well, I'm gonna go order one right after we get off the show. Thank you T public. All right, we got a super chat from Crafty Matt as well. Uh, Crafty Matt gave us five bucks US. He said, uh, DG, Greg Gillespie, maybe. I'm not sure. Or good game. Yeah. What made you choose Avalon Hill's Wilderness Survival Map for your base hex map for each book? Will you have a fifth book up or up upper right? Uh, yeah. So, what I've done, um, in case anyone who's listening doesn't know, so this is the, uh, this is the old outdoor survival map. Sorry, I want to make sure I get it in the center of the screen there for you. Uh, and this was recommended uh, reading in the original D&D &D books, the uh, OD&D &D, that is. And so that's uh, it's my understanding that Greyhawk, amongst others, were were on that map somewhere, and it was used for uh, wilderness hex crawling. So. Uh, Barrel Maze is uh, located uh, here, uh, the Forbidden Caverns of Archaea here, uh, Dwero Deep is, is up here, and uh, I, I filled in four of, well, I've sort of like cross-sected into six sections, so whether the next adventure is here or down here, you have to wait to find out. <laughs> Right, so um, just a little tip of the cap. <laughs> we're we're getting close to the end time here. So if any of you have any other questions for for Greg, we were going to try to talk about some of the other um, news and controversies recently in uh, in the OSR, but uh, I think we we probably aren't going to have time to to really do those justice, unfortunately. But uh, well, if you want to find out. If you want to check out what what was going on with the Wizards employees revolt uh, on against the fact that Hasbro didn't didn't make a public statement condemning the the recent Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade, uh, check out my channel. It's the the my latest video is on that subject. And uh, if you want to find out about what's been going on with Drive Through RPG, uh, check out Lamentations of the Flame Princess channel. Um, and I'm probably going to do a video sometime soon about the latest demographic information that Wizards of the Coast released about uh, who actually plays D&D uh, uh, &D 5th edition. But uh, I guess I'll leave that for a video on my channel, too. 
Well, if you if you need to, we can do a two parter, and I can join you again at some point in the future or on your next yeah, show. Right. You we know, really do a, a, a show once every four weeks, and four weeks from now, I mean, you'd be we'd be very happy at some point to have you back again, right? Um, yeah, we, sure. I'd be happy to do it. And if uh, uh, if either you get um, other comments or questions, or you just want me to comment on um, on the news stories that you wanted to talk about, I'd be happy to do that. That would be great. That would be great. But uh, four weeks from now, or eight weeks from now, or 12 weeks from now, there's going to be a whole other set of controversies for us to talk about, I'm sure, right? It's always, that seems to be like the sweet spot of just enough time that there's like always uh, two or three things that are that are worth discussing, you know? Uh, we got a question here from Bill Griggs. He says, Greg, are you or did you run Duero Deep as a West Marches game? And do you think it's practical to have players return to Hamlet at each session? Um, so uh, I'm always a big advocate of returning back to the town before the end of each session. I don't let players camp in the dungeon. If, if they do that, bad things uh, happen um, usually. So I discourage that and I think it's just it's a bit of a cop out. And given that uh, I have a pool of players, uh, some show up to one session, maybe not the next, different group for the third session, so on and so forth. It just makes for an easier inflow and outflow of gaming. Having said that, Drero Deep is, the, is, a, is a subterranean hex crawl. So uh, with the map I showed you earlier, so you're, you are gonna have to camp uh, in the dungeon um, at times. And uh, so, so yeah, um, that, it's the one dungeon I've done so far where, where that's encouraged as opposed to discouraged. Okay, and uh, Sad Wings Raging has a, an interesting personal question for you here. Where did you go to, to college? Uh, where did I go to university? Um, so um, I went to places both in Canada and the U.S. So I started at Wilfrid Laurier University, which is in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. So it's in the province, uh, about an hour and a half drive from where I live now. And then I went to uh, Canisius College in Buffalo, New York for Teachers College. And then I did my master's degree uh, at Brock University, which is um, near Niagara Falls, just on the Canadian side of the border. And I did my PhD at the University of Western Ontario, which is um, also about an hour and a half from where I live now. Uh -huh. I, I went, I did my, my bachelor's and master's at the U of A uh, a few years after Jordan Peterson and at the same time as Ezra Levant. So uh, that university has a lot to answer for. <laughs> yeah, they do. That's top notch. You know, a little funny story here that uh, somebody pointed out to me that recently Zach Smith, you know, Zach Sabbath, he 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 crawled out of wherever he's been hiding to do a, like a video interview, and uh, it, it, I, and it was like a you know I don't know a four hour interview or something like that. But uh, in at one point he commented. Um, on the topic of free speech, right? Because I've been kind of critical of the fact that, you know, he's he's the first to whine about his his own freedom when when you know he's being canceled, but he's at times um, supported other other gaming creators being uh, persecuted that that don't align with his politics, right? And he he made this comment about how oh well you know uh, I talk about you know I as in Zach talks about. Um, the importance of truth and that's more important than free speech and and you know i'm talking about things on a level that is like way beyond anything that the pundit could even understand and i'm like motherfucker you know i studied <laughs> i studied history and comparative studies at, at one of the the top departments at in its time you know and you know one of the tops in north america one of the hundred tops in the world you know and and you're you did art college dude you know like there is nothing you could talk about about truth philosophy or free speech that that I wouldn't be able to swamp you on. Yeah, they, 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 they don't have of those discussions, it. and uh, uh, I'm frustrated by it. And you know, it, it's been very sad for me because you know I went through my training in the '90s um, when there was something that still resembled free speech on campus. Yes, and, me too. Uh, and, and universities have to be that place where yeah. where uh, freedom of speech is maintained, but but it's collapsed and um, uh, like uh, professors self-censor uh, based on their, their subject matter. Um, the, 
you know, you, you're just, it's, uh, it's uh, been, com the, the Worthman loss, it's been completely overtaken. Um, and it's a shame because there's lots of young people who possess moderate or conservative voices who really can't speak. And uh, that's not why I got in business. I'm a free speech absolutist. And um, that free speech, freedom of speech is the basis on which all other freedoms flow for me. And I very strongly believe in that. Yeah, well, I was originally going to do a doctorate, but I dropped out of academia at the start of the 2000s because even by then, I realized that it just, I would just find it intolerable to keep being there, you know. And today I'm very much of the opinion you know, the public school system, right, the K to 12 school system is this ridiculous 19th century invention that we keep using today. And the university system is this ridiculous 800 year old mm -hmm. uh, institution that we keep using today. Um, and frankly, both of them are just not viable in our in our modern technological world. And they have beyond that been completely subverted by uh these ideological totalitarians you know we have to as far as i'm concerned the entire education system in the west needs to be scrapped and rebuilt with something completely different something decentralized and that will have a uh, built-in immunity to to wholesale takeover by by a groups of ideological radicals you know yeah well when i went through the purpose of um higher education was knowledge creation in whatever yeah. field of endeavor uh, but now it's been completely overtaken by social justice, and if you don't uh, if you don't toe the line, you're 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 going to make your job miserable. So uh, it's really it's un unfortunate. Um, but uh, uh, you know, John Haidt, the American psychology uh, professor, uh, suggested that in the American Academy, there's probably one conservative professor for every twenty uh, liberal. Uh, in Canada, I'd argue it's much worse than that. It's probably one to thirty or one to thirty-five. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's, um, there's the only. Uh, I've come to the conclusion at this point in my career, there's only one kind of diversity that matters, and that's um, that's uh, diversity of thought. Diversity Absolutely. of thought cuts across race. It cuts across class. It cuts across uh, every every uh, category. The government and uh, that what that wants to use to divide us, diversity of thought cuts through all of those. And the one thing that we don't possess in higher learning is diversity of thought, and that's that's a real shame, because now it's just a, a woke factory um, than it is anything else. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> uh, Malachi says uh, Arizona is giving money to parents so the kids can go to the school of their choice. Yeah. Well, I think that's one important step into the future is that if the funding goes to individuals and families rather than to to government or or quasi private institutions, um, then that that flips the entire script, because then then people can organize educational pods to suit whatever whatever they want to do and it becomes something a, a, a matter of volunteerism that will prove it or, or fail on its own qualities you know so uh, that's to me that's the, an example of the kind of decentralization that we have to start applying mm -hmm. and the fact is massive funding like the problem with student loans isn't student debt it's that it it, it corrupts the universities you know because suddenly the universities became big business on the on the backs of student loans. You know, if student loans didn't exist, universities would suddenly have to do a heck of a lot more and, and do things very differently and change their priorities quite radically uh, in order to survive. You know? Well, I mean, when I was a PhD student, like if you want to uh, if you want to carry yourself as a PhD student in Canada, in case anybody doesn't know, you have to have something called a, a, a SHRC doctoral fellowship. So SHRC is an acronym for the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And it's a federal body and you have to apply. I applied in the area of cultural history, which at the time was the hardest to get funded. Thankfully, I was. Now, if you want to apply to SHRC, you have to have a, a die statement. You have to have a diversity inclusion equity statement. And I don't think my PhD uh, dissertation would have been funded if if there was a, a die statement at that time. And um, this is just something that uh, 
what the ideology has overtaken how you get funded. It's overtaken what journals you can publish in. It's overtaken the tone and language you use inside your your uh, your research. And uh, I won't be part of you to it. I just won't. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So I guess that might be a good place to, to end it for today. Um, and uh, thank you to everybody who, who is watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the to the channel and to like it and to hit the notification, even though don't don't count necessarily on the notification bell to, to warn you when we're when we're on. Uh, our next show is barring any unexpected change it should be on, I believe, the 31st of July. Um, so uh, mark that spot on your calendars. And uh, I don't know who we'll have. Maybe we'll have the basic expert on because he was supposed to be on in our last show that had to be canceled at the last minute due to technical issues. Um, so, uh, we'll, but we'll see. And uh, I hope you all check that out. Check out my channel. Subscribe. Uh, check out Venger's channel. I don't think Job has a channel other than this one. But <laughs> uh, no, yeah, uh, I need to. I'm just I'm like my life. One of these days. And definitely check out Barrow Maze and uh, Duero Deep, which are, uh, well, Barrow Maze, at least I can speak from first hand, is an excellent dungeon crawl. And I'm, yes. I have every confidence that, uh, that Duero Deep will be as well, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's really good stuff. And uh, probably, could, well, I mean, I know it's compatible with Lion and Dragon because I ran it in my Dark Albion campaign, you know, with some slight modifications. Um, I mean, you so, got to tailor uh, it to your, to your game and your your players and such yeah ex exactly but uh yeah it's really good stuff so thank you for for being with us greg and hopefully we'll have you on again sometime thank you very much yeah thank you very much both of you i really appreciate it appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to your viewers and uh talk about my favorite thing dungeon dragons excellent awesome we're going to um uh next next month we're going to have uh we're going to have the basic expert on right uh pundit that's the idea. If he can yeah. make it on the 31st, we'll, we'll have okay. him on then. Right. So I'll reach out to him again. We had to uh, unfortunately bump him for you, Greg. But um, but yeah, we, we definitely are uh, interested in getting him back on the next episode. And uh, also, we didn't have time to talk about it, but I, I spent a lot of time doing some production on a special uh, little video. So I think when, as we close out, I'm just going to play the video at the end because I think it's pretty hilarious. Well, show, show us the video. Maybe we'll have a comment or two on it. Oh, and then okay. we can, we can... So this is yeah. James Raggi from James Raggi's channel. Uh, uh, he, he's been patiently standing by uh, from an undisclosed gay bathhouse in Helsinki to uh, read <laughs> us the RPG Now hostile marketing text. So let's, uh, let's, let's take it over to James. Quote. Hostile marketing. Our policy regarding potentially offensive content, see product standards guidelines, reported by customers, is to deactivate such titles while they are being reviewed. Publishers who deliberately court controversy by making public declarations or accusations of censorship resulting from this process in order to draw attention to their products will be considered to use hostile marketing. Publishers who direct or support public accusations of impropriety or censorship toward one bookshelf when their controversial titles are rejected or removed will also be considered to use hostile marketing. This behavior will not be tolerated. We have adopted a strict one warning policy for those who engage in hostile marketing. The first incident will prompt a warning, and after a second incident, their account will be removed from our site permanently and immediately. Unquote. Okay, so thank you, James. James, uh, he's been sitting, standing by for quite a quite an amount of time here to deliver that message to us. So thanks again, James. Never, never has an unkempt 
shirtless man made so much sense. <laughs> At least not in my personal life experience. <laughs> Had you heard that before? That that's literally, Greg. That's the that's the text of the uh, the the new changes to, at dr at Drive Through RPG. Yeah, Which so I read it, and uh, yeah. so like, did he come like right out of the shower to the to the video, or <laughs> I don't what know. Happened? What was the backstory to that? Well, apparently on his channel, he tends to do his videos shirtless. That's what I've heard. It's the first time I ever saw a video of his on his channel. And uh, yeah, the, he's a big fan or something like that that I don't know about. He, I, he's a, he's, he does all everything on green screen, but he never does anything with a green screen for some reason. So I figured I'd help him out there. Well, the interesting thing about about the, you know, the change in policy of drive through is uh, I mean, first of all, we suspect that it was largely a reaction to Venture Satanis's last two products, which which were specifically, like I said earlier, they were specifically politicized products meant to be critical of, uh, on the one hand, the, you know, the, uh, well, drive through very recently sponsored a bundle. Well, then they didn't sponsor. They, they allowed a bundle product that was uh, the product for reproductive rights or something like that, which was raising money to, you know, pro-abortion groups um, on, as a reaction to the leaked memo at the time that has now become, you know, that now it's become officially, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's come out uh, publicly that uh, Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned. Um, and so he did a, a product that was essentially a, a spoof book, although he he claims it's a real that it's really a playable adventure, and I'm I'm sure technically it is, but it's it's very clearly propaganda, critical of the the pro-abortion movement. And then he did this other one, the one he he advertised today, that was kind of critical of uh, you know gender theory, and of course both of those products got flagged. The interesting thing is that that he just said in the in our section when we were shilling our products that uh, drive through got back to him about the second product and they, they only requested a couple of changes that he felt were, were acceptable to him. So um, drive through has in their policy taken a kind of hard line specifically about what they you call hostile marketing so that, you know, uh, what they didn't want was to have people making books that they knew drive through would, would flag and possibly prohibit and then try to market based on that um it's and they didn't want people to, to be you know essentially promoting themselves by 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 trying to criticize drive through mm -hmm. and uh you know i i agree with with a lot of um raji's um concerns about that for sure right but then in the first test case after this up these updated terms they did not just outright, you know, ban Venger or ban his book, even right? They they they've made some um, conditions that they wanted altered, and part of it was in like the text that was on the website, you know, on the on the drive through page for the product. What he had put as his blurb, they wanted him to alter that, and they wanted to alter a couple of things that they felt were were too overtly political. Um, the problem is still though, like, would they do the same thing? with an overtly political product, and we know that there are many overtly political products that are on, let's say, the other side, you know, because mm -hmm. I suspect that they probably wouldn't. Um, you know, what gets um, lost in this chat, in this whole conversation too, Pundit, is, uh, yeah. um, you know, when, when Venger made that abortion one, uh, he did that in reaction to, uh, you know, the Roe v. We, uh, Roe v. Wade leak, and then all these people put up like pro-abortion uh like fundraising type of pdfs on rpg oh. now and so yeah, yeah. venger was specifically reacting to that but now you know people since then people are like oh it's just because of roe v wade that venger did this and stuff and um he would at the time he wasn't actually reacting to that he was reacting to that rpg now or drive through rpg whatever the hell they're called was allowing RPG political, political yeah, activism, was allowing yeah. political action so he's like okay well i'll do one on the other side and of course, yeah. he got shot down right away. So, yeah, and that that's the problem, right? And I think that's the part yeah. that DTRPG doesn't get is that if they if they make, you know, the, if they want to make very clear cut rules about what what they want or don't want you to put on in in their on their site, 
um, I think almost everybody would would say, well, you know, you know, you might not agree with all the rules, but as long as they had the rules, they were very clear and specific, and you knew what what was or was not allowed, and that was universal. I think most people would would be able to accept that and work within that context. The problem is if there ends up being a double standard, right? That that right, yeah. it's rules for one side but not for the other. You know, the other gets away with anything, and the one side does not. You know. Right. Um, yeah. And part of the problem is that the, their moderation system is based on um, people complaining about the product. And of course, the people on the ideological left are are censorious and therefore will try to, to complain to get these products banned, whereas people on the right don't don't usually do that, you know. Yeah, um, so it becomes an uneven field, you know. Um, but I will I will recognize based on what Venger said about, you know, their response to this, this latest product of his, that um, drive through, wh whereas on paper, they have set these, these hard, kind of hard line points that, that give them the, op the, the possibility of banning products or banning publishers uh, that they, that, that cross them uh, in practice with Venger, they've, they've shown certain, elements of, of moderation you know putting certain conditions but not not uh outright banning his book you know um without without a second thought you know so i i'm willing to to recognize that at least and hope that that's a sign that they're that they're kind of listening a bit to to the fact that you know there are a lot of people and you know a lot of the gamers a lot of people that buy you know, a lot of people buy lamentations of the flame princess products you know I, they're they're probably uh, bigger sellers than uh, than any any of my stuff or uh, any of your stuff, Greg, and certainly more than Venger's stuff, right? Uh, so you know they 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 I think that they they recognize that they've got to to at least play fair to a certain extent, and I hope that they'll keep that in mind in the future. You know. Yeah, and Greg, I, Greg, I do want to respect your time. Sorry, I was kind of hoping to play that and leave, and and now we've no, hit you no, fifteen minutes good. over. No. Are you okay on time or? Do you want to just go? Yeah, uh, it's okay. Yeah, uh, I do. It's important, um, and I, I do think they've created a little bit of a slippery slope for themselves. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how. Like, this is a moving a moving target, and um, we're going to find out how consistent the rules are over time as different things crop up and which products which products are getting flagged and wh which ones are not. Now. I don't have any particular desire to, uh, you know, to go to go down that road. Um, it's not, you know, how I want to do what I do. But having said that, I respect the people who do want to go down that road. And it is creativity, and there should be some freedom of expression. And one side, as was pointed out, uh, does tend to complain, and the other side doesn't. Um, I, you know, I. I haven't met too many people with a conservative or moderate viewpoint who are going at the left to have products removed or complaining that they go to conventions or so on and so forth. But uh, the people on the left, uh, are the, the far left, let me be clear, uh, do tend to, right. to make those complaints and they are some, uh, tend to be censorious of the right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, like I said, if, 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 if drive through said, well, we don't want anything with contemporary political messaging and they were they were even handed on that, you know. I I would find that acceptable if they said, well, you know, you can have anything with political messaging, but we don't want to have stuff that is I don't know, uh, you know, pornographic art or something like that. Well, you know, like whatever the rule they made, as long as they, it was a clear rule and it was applied to everyone equally, I think that would be fine. And mm -hmm. I will say, you know, like none of my books have any contemporary politics in them, right? My books are never they never have some kind of an ideological contemporary message. They're always, you know, books that that look at a specific setting and and have detailed cultural stuff about that setting, but it's never meant to present some kind of a modern day, you know, uh, political declaration or something like that. And drive through is never, <clears throat> you know, even though I, outside of, of the gaming products that I make, I have political views. They've never they've never come after my books. They've also never promoted my books, but you know, whatever they they have, they they can decide what books they want to promote or not. But they've always given the the platform there, and it's it's fine, you know. 
of course, I'm not a publisher. I'm just a writer. But, uh, you know, none of none of my publishers have ever indicated that drive through has um, has has re responded to, you know, coming after me or something like that, even though sure. some people in the, on the left have tried to. Sure. Haven't they? To, but haven't they screwed up your like search and stuff a couple of times when you've had a new book come out? Well, that's possible. I've had a few people say, I mean, I don't know, it could be, it could be them. It could be, I don't want to, I don't want to, to, to automatically assume blame here, but, uh, uh, you know, I've had a few people saying that they were searching on drive through for sword and caravan and couldn't find it with the, with the basic search function, you know? Yeah, I was one of those. Uh, I was trying to buy it. I couldn't find it. I finally had like searched it on Google or a Cozia or something. I don't use Google anymore. Um, but uh, and then it got me to the page and I was like, what the hell? Why couldn't I find this? Yeah. Well, if you don't find it with the title, look for RPG Pundit or look for Mad Scribe Games. The thing is, when I search for it on drive through, it shows up. I just, you know, if you type sword, uh, yeah. I type so sword. Don't, game, don't, don't right search away, for so RPG I'm, Pundit because it gives you all of your RPG Pundit re uh, presents at the top of the list. That's that's the problem with having like 120 RPG yeah. products <laughs> is that you'll have to wade your way through. But hey, maybe while you do that, you'll find a few other books you want, you know? So so don't listen to Joe, guys. Do a search for RPG funded <laughs> and buy everything you find that I've I'm written there. you selling your newest book. One of the great, yeah. uh, great sub-disciplines in history is called historiography, where you uh, take a, a book or journal article and you situate it within its time period and as a reflection of the author. And what I learned from that was everything is a reflection of the time period in which it was created and a reflection of the beliefs, values, worldviews, and prejudices of that author. And so to suggest that you can write something that, it, that you can somehow remove yourself from your contemporary context and write about something devoid of that context is uh, fantasy. Uh, it's just not possible. And where you might get one product where you could might read it, say with the cover off of it and say, okay, well, I'm not quite sure what that time, wh where that came from or when, if you look at things in a broader scope as a literature, and then you're going even, even with rough periods of debt by decade, you can start to see and decipher change over time because everything's a reflection of time period, just like uh, rules additions are also a reflection of their time period. So, I mean, it's a, to me, it's a bit of a slippery slope. I, I sort of wish they, I think they just were like, well, we've got some problem people. Let's make up a vague enough uh, position where we can just get rid of somebody if we don't want to deal with them anymore. And that's what it read like to me. Well, I, I agree with what you're you're saying there, but there's also a big difference between you know somebody writing a book or a novel or a TV show that um, that is you know a reflection of them in their place and time versus somebody writing a book that is ostensibly an RPG book but is actually you know a, 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 um, an ideological manifesto about I don't know environmentalism or you know uh, Christian conservatism or whatever you know like if they, there, there's a difference between um between uh unconscious elements of reflecting the zeitgeist of your age versus mm -hmm. consciously creating a product that is little more than a skin suit for your own current day politics you know yeah well there's not that much difference between those two things sometimes <laughs> <laughs> well uh i i don't know I've, I've always been a bit critical of that that opinion of historiography that says that we can't uh we can't if if you make a conscious effort, uh, that that you can in you could in fact um, try to put yourself in the paradigm of a different place in a different time, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what I try to do, for example, with my medieval authentic products, you know. So well, obviously, it's not going to be a hundred percent, but it is going to be uh, something that will that that is meant to reflect, you know, like my 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 medieval authentic products reflect the world as the medieval person understood it rather than the medieval world as someone from 2022 would look at it, you know? Right. Um, but given, you know, we don't, we don't have a complete historical record. So we're just dealing with what's left over and trying to yeah. decipher from that. So I, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Uh, my perspective would still be, you can do your very best, but at the end of the day, you're still, 
who you are writing in 2022 and uh, inferring from the evidence available. And yeah. that is in, uh, that's a, 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 a perspective that has pitfalls. We just do the best we can with what we have. And yeah. uh, ultimately, we're still, you know, people do, whether they intend to or not, inject their, uh, their uh, language uh, from their time period into historical work and so on. And, you know, and, and this carries over, like, you know, people and people will skin stuff, as you pointed out. So they might, um, I don't know, have a huge, two huge trees that knocked over and, and they're supposed to represent, I don't know, the Twin Towers or something like that. You know, like that <laughs> people, people put that sort of stuff in there or they'll have little tips of the cap to political figures or so on and so forth. I mean, so like um, pretty much anything that's religious is is in the Western world is, of course, either a reflection of the Bible or uh, counter to Christianity or the Bible. So like I, I've got a lot of Christianity in, in my books. Um, part of it's implicit and part of it's explicit and it's part of it's conscious and some part of it's unconscious. And I didn't actually realize um, the extent to, to, to that until I had it uh, demonstrated to me by a, by a student. And I'm like, well, actually, you know, that I, there is some unconscious uh, effort, I guess, there on my part. And then and the other part too is I have, I have racial enmity in my in my books. Like, does that am I a shitlord because uh, you know it makes for an interesting storyline? Uh, wow. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying for sure. Um, but I think drive through. I I hope drive through is looking to like their concern should be if anything people who are you know making political overt political diatribes and not to start going after um you know cherry picking products for supposed unconscious bias that uh that that doesn't match the the current dominant you know uh ideological establishment of culture in 2022 if mm -hmm. they do that well you know they're 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 going to be screwed because they're going to have to uh, to ban almost everything, you know, certainly almost everything in the real OSR, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying for sure. All right. So on that note, I guess now, yes, we will we'll, we'll finish up. So I hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, we'll have someone will have to let uh, James Raggi know he is now an honorary inappropriate character. <laughs> <laughs> he's earned it. We didn't discuss I think so, it, but yeah. I think he's earned it. He's 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 certainly inappropriate after that video. <laughs> I think like the rest acting though, like he, I think he really, he sort of nailed that part of it. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes, very dramatic reading. All right, guys, it's been a pleasure, and we'll uh, we'll see you all next time. Yeah, thanks, thanks so, so much, much for, for coming, coming on, Greg. Greg. This, this has been, been a real pleasure. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. pleasure was mine. Thank you so much, and thank you to your viewers. I really appreciate it. All right, have a good one. All right, everyone, take care. <laughs>